Well, how do you follow that? I mean, talk about understanding the land and the history and the culture and heritage. Uh, it's really uh, reminds us all of why we care about the landscape and conservation and this wildlife corridor opportunity. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, my name is Nick Wiley. Uh, I'm, I'm home. I'm back home in Florida. I, uh, I spent a uh, good many years in the state working with the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission and um, just, just love the state and uh, love what's going on with the corridor and all, ex all the excitement. And uh, I, I am thrilled to have a couple of guests with us today that are going to help uh, talk about our connections and, and the importance of working with the, with the federal government and federal funding opportunities. And how do you go from that to talk about federal funding? I don't know, but we'll figure it out. Um, it, it is actually a, a very important topic. Um, and I want to bring out our guests now. We have with us Shannon Estenas, Assistant Secretary for Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. And we also have Zach Bodane, who's the Director of Government Relations for the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. Yes. <clears throat> So I expect uh, Shannon is a familiar face for many of you and uh, thrilled to have you back here at home in Florida. And uh, I do want to say, uh, those of you that may not be aware of the scope of work she's involved in, um, the title Secretary for Fish and Parks, Fish and Wildlife and Parks kind of doesn't really tell the story as well. I'm just going to say, just to put it in perspective, the, uh, the landscape Shannon oversees when you talk about national wildlife refuges and we talk about our, our national parks, it's bigger than Texas. So just think about that. We're talking 180 million acres of a landscape. And uh, so it's really, it's a big job and that's just part of the job. There's a lot of other moving parts. But I also want to tell a little bit of a personal story. Is every time you guys drive across Tamiami Trail and see those bridges, and, and think about water moving through those bridges down in the Everglades National Park um, and what a big deal that is, you, you should think of Shannon because those bridges wouldn't be there without her hard work. Um, that's just one example of all that she's done in her career in Florida, working at the state level, at the NGO level, and, and now working at the federal level. Um, so I can't thank you enough, Shannon, for being with us, joining us, and being part of this. And I'll move over to Zach now, and Zach's, um, Zach works with the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership, which is an NGO that is headquartered in Washington, D.C., but works all over the country. And Zach has the wonderful job of serving as Director of Government Relations. And everybody knows what that is. That's just, you know, you just go out to a lot of lunches and dinners and hang out with people. <laughs> <laughs> but let me say, Zach comes to us with a really cool perspective. He, he actually worked out west for a number of years uh, as policy director for the Western Landowners Alliance. And also, he also worked before that with the Western Governors Association. You want to talk about a bunch of hard charging people, you talk, bring a bunch of governors together and try to manage that. But his, his, his role has been working in the policy arena, shaping policy. He's had a good bit of experience helping shape policy with regard to wildlife corridors out west, which is a pretty big deal too. And um, he's, he's had a lot of experience with the Endangered Species Act and, and just working lands, his background with working lands. And, and I know all of us agree that, that working lands, our, our ranch lands, our ag lands in Florida is such a critical part of the Florida Wildlife Corridor. And uh, many of you that represent those landscapes are with us today. And we, uh, we want to talk about how all the pieces come together to help fund and help support in partnership conservation on that landscape. So let's jump in. I'll, I'll turn to you, Shan, and talk a little bit about when this Florida Wildlife Corridor experience first got on your radar, when you first thought about it. Um, I, first of all, hi, everybody. That's great to not see you. I, I'm assuming <laughs> <laughs> you're in the audience. Um, I think I first, this concept first, I became aware of it it feels like a dozen years ago, does that sound right? And it would have come from Carlton, directly from Carlton Ward. I'm sure it's because I attended a slideshow of Carlton's incredible work. I don't know if he's here or in the room, but 
Um, and to, to sort of, I've been kind of watching and listening with, um, on the, to the panels that have been running before us, and I, I can't tell you how um, incredibly wonderful it is to hear how far this concept has come, and um, you know how many folks are now just, it's tripping off of everyone's tongue to talk about the Florida Wildlife Corridor. It's just, it's absolutely tremendous. It's an incredible testament to everyone who had a hand in um, conceiving it and then moving it to implementation. And we're gonna talk, I'm sure, a lot about that. But it's been, it feels like a dozen years. Wow. Um, yeah. Well, thank you. Um, Zach, uh, you're coming from an outside perspective. What, how did it get on your radar? What have you, what is your perspective here? Yeah, sure. So I was definitely a little bit more of a latecomer to the game than that, um, but better late than never, I suppose. Um, you know, I think I really, started catching wind of this around 2021 when the legislation was signed into law. Um, you know, Nick, as you mentioned, had been working for most of my career actually back out west uh, when I was with Western Governors and Western Landowners, was working to stand up um, big game migration corridors predominantly. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot of need for that type of work, but I was really struck with the Florida Wildlife Corridor at the sheer number of species and the diversity of species that are included. You know, we're not just talking big game species that are hunted and fish it, or fished. It's um, at risk, T and E, which you know, I think is near and dear to my heart. So I was encouraged just as someone who has long seen and beat the drum on the need for more proactive conservation, getting ahead of this long before we're talking about the ESA. You know, I see this as a real pathway there. Very good. Well, let's dive in now. So Shannon, I would like to start to get your perspective. There's um, this administration has, has really leaned into conservation and across the entire country. And um, a lot of that excitement has been through the America Be the Beautiful plan. Um, would you talk a little bit about how you see that program aligns with what's, what's going on here in Florida with the corridor? So I'll, I'll respond to it by telling a, a little anecdote and I'm gonna call out uh, Kathy Burchett from the um, Fish and Wildlife Service who is here today. And I know many of you know Kathy. Um, so, Early on in, in President Biden's administration, he rolled out the America the Beautiful plan. And when I read that plan, the first sort of thought that came to my mind is, this is how we do conservation in Florida. And, and for, for those of you who don't know Interior very well, I'm, I'm something of a unicorn in Interior because I'm from the East and most assistant secretaries in Interior are from the West because most of our Interior lands are actually out West. And I recognized, you know, that the president didn't just say, I want you to go out and conserve 30% of America's waters, lands and waters by 2030. He set that conservation goal, the first national conservation goal in our, in our country's history. But he also sort of told us how to do it. He said, I want you to do it with communities. I want you to do it in partnership. I want it to be voluntary. I want it to be community driven, community led. I want tribes at the table. Um, that was the vision. So it wasn't just what do you want us to do, but how do you want us to do it? And I don't know, very early on after Secretary Holland was sworn into office, she had a, uh, she had a big t sort of town hall all employees meeting, thousands and thousands of people on the, on the phone, and we were asked as assistant secretaries to choose one person um, from our bureaus to sort of introduce themselves and talk about their work. And of course, I had 50,000 people to choose from, and I immediately thought of Kathy Burchett, who I'd worked with for so many years and who I felt really embodied um, exactly the kind of partner building, on the ground, place-based work that we really wanted to lean into. And so in preparation, you know, I called Kathy. I said, I really want you to come and, and be, you know, be my person on this call. And as we were prepping for that, she had already, she had read the America the Beautiful plan, and she said, I have exactly the project that is America the Beautiful. She said, it's the Southwest Florida corridor, that wildlife corridor that we're, you know, we've been talking about for so many years and that people are now really kind of getting excited about. And I, I, I want you to know that, you know, over the last couple of years, Kathy and so many others, many of you in this room, have been scoping out that project. And you guys have, there have been more than 30 uh, public discussions. We, there have been 2,600 public comments um, and uh, all kinds of perspectives and ideas about 
how to really focus on that Southwest Florida section and really take advantage of those opportunity areas, you know, that the corridor has represented. And I'm really thrilled to let you know that within the next hour today, the service is going to be releasing its draft land protection plan, its conceptual management plan, and its draft environmental assessment for what is now called the Everglades to Gulf Conservation Area. So I tell that story because, <laughs> um, thank you. I tell that story, Nick, because again, it's illustrative of the fact that what we know how to do here in Florida is exactly the kind of conservation that the administration wants to lean into and support. Um, so I'm just really proud, uh, you know, to be, um, you know, your colleague and to watch you guys succeed in this. It's tremendous. Sorry, well, that was a long answer. That, that no, that's comment. a good announcement because <laughs> if I could just, I understand that when you when you to bring uh, the staff and the, the resources of the, of the Fish and Wildlife. Uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to the table in these kind of landscape level programs, you, you kind of have to go through this process to open the door. And this, no this really opens the door to engaging further in how can we all collaborate and how can we protect this landscape, how can we manage this landscape and work together. So it, it seems this is a really great step forward to open that door. Well, I certainly hope so. Absolutely. I mean, a conservation area like this, what this would do if, if it moves forward would be to um, give us a whole new set of tools to work with. We could bring new federal dollars to the table to really kind of pursue the kinds of goals that I think the corridor has been working on for a very long time. It's all about shared goals, and America the Beautiful is all about identifying those shared goals and then working together to make the biggest toolbox you possibly can to pursue those goals. And that's, I think that's what you know you all are doing here in Florida. And um, you know it's really it's really fun to watch. So I love that you're. Starting the process by listening, by oh, reaching out and listening, because my mom reminded me all along. You know, two ears and two one, ears, yeah, one and mouth. I never two quite got that. But um, <laughs> but it's really and, and government's not always best at mm. listening. Yeah. And so I really appreciate that. That's the first phase of trying to bring people together and listen and, and hear, because I mean this this community, a lot of people are, are live in that landscape and work in that landscape. So yeah, that's good. And, and so what will be kicked off is a is a sort of a public comment period. So we'll further expand the kind of the public's reach. You'll public will now have something to actually look at, some concepts to look at and react to, and then the team uh, and everybody, all the partners that they're working with, will uh, use that input, you know, to decide how and and whether to move forward. And that when we talk about kind of work on refuges and landscape, land protection and conservation. Land and Water Conservation Fund often comes to play in that regard. And I know that that's something that you, you know, you kind of have to be involved in as you. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, we, I was telling somebody the other day that I, I've had a 25 plus year career in conservation and I always thought I had, an, you know, an incredibly exciting career. I loved my career. But I have to say that if they're, for the young people that are out there, I can't, I can't, I'm, all of you are young, I know it, um, <laughs> that I really can't think of a more exciting time to be in conservation. And a lot of it is because we, w there, we especially here in the East, especially in places like Florida, we've built a lot of muscle memory. Like, it's like we know how to do this. Yeah. We know how to do it. And we've got tools now that we did not have before, including a fully funded yeah. land and water conservation fund. That is a game, fully funded, y'all, forever. Um, that is a game changer. <laughs> um, yeah, for land protection. Okay, well good, well let's get Zach to jump in now, because <laughs> you guys at, at TRCP actually work every day trying to uh, advocate for uh, policy and, and budget wins for conservation, for sportsmen and women. Talk a little bit about what you see in the last few years that are now moving forward on the table for funding opportunities that, that can really come to bear for what we're trying to do here in Florida. Yeah, absolutely. And um, unfortunately, I don't have as exciting of an announcement, but I can at least talk about the boatload of money coming out of Congress, so not all bad. Um, and I'm definitely going to need my notes for this one. It's that much. Um, so starting with the bipartisan infrastructure laws folks might be familiar with, um, you know, the, Nick, you mentioned it, this is an exciting time. It's an truly unprecedented amount of funding coming out, and there's so much 
energy and action around this. Um, so to zoom in first on that bipartisan infrastructure law, you know, there was 350 million created um, for a grant program, wildlife movement pilot program within the Department of Transportation. Um, the Assistant Secretary and her team have been great in working with the department and helping move that project forward. Um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity there to look at wildlife vehicle collisions, reducing those, looking at wildlife passage. You know, I think as we look at what the Florida Corridor can tap into, you know, I would imagine those funds can come to bear. Um, there were $1.4 billion also coming out of that bill. Um, that are going to ecosystem restoration and resilience within the department. And feel free to step me in if I no, speak on it. You know, you know better than I do. A great job. <laughs> um, and then, you know, those are going to go toward priority ecosystems, do habitat restoration. Um, another massive piece of legislation that folks might have heard of, which is the Inflation Reduction Act. There's a lot in there that might not be explicitly pointed at wildlife migration or supporting it, but I think there's a ton in there that can go to support that and a ton that can land on the ground here in Florida. Um, looking over now at the U.S. Department of Agriculture side of things, there were $20 billion included in that legislation to facilitate climate smart agriculture on private land through existing farm bill conservation programs. Um, USDA is now kind of working through the kinks of how they land that money on the ground. Some of it's already gone out. I think the way they're looking at climate smart practices right now is sticking to what's in the law. So that is to say, looking at practices that are mitigating climate, are reducing emissions, um, and I think are, are not so much on some of the work that we're really excited about. I mean, that, that's important stuff, but also looking at some of the more co-benefit focused work that can benefit wildlife, climate resilience, ecosystems. Um, so I think we're excited to see that money as the USDA gets their arms around it a little bit more start to evolve and start to land in some of these private ecosystems, um, particularly here in Florida. So. Finally, just one more thing I want to touch on. Um, there's 450 million through that bill that was conveyed to the US Forest Service that can go to work um, on the ground right now for private forest owners. That's particularly targeted at underserved and small parcel landowners. But I think the idea there is to really bring those folks into this equation, help them build climate resilience, ecosystem resilience on their land and do treatments there. Um, and then as, as we all have mentioned, the Land and Water Conservation Fund through the Great American Outdoors Act, it's, it's amazing. It's, Permanent, it's 900 million a year. What else can you say? <laughs> <laughs> Not much. M mic drop. They're very good. I and and I, when I introduce myself, I, I think I've failed to mention that I currently work with Ducks Unlimited, uh, and have been for over five years. And uh, a wonderful organization that really gets down in the down in the trenches and working with landowners, working on public and private lands. Um, and one of the things that we we do as an organization and. Uh, is look at these federal and state funding opportunities and try to help connect the dots, connect the puzzle pieces, so that you you got a chunk of federal. We do this a lot with the North American Wetlands Conservation Act. If you, you take a chunk of federal funds that now m many of these programs need need matching funds. Well, we go out and work on the landscape, work with partners to bring matching funds to the table. A lot of these the farm bill programs, a lot of programs require match. Uh, and one of the things we do, and I've got to say a shout out to all the NGOs that work in this space, are really good at trying to bring these things together to help connect the dots, connect the funds that flow through federal and state and other avenues so that we can do real meaningful things on the landscape, whether it's restoration, land protection, uh, habitat management, things like that. So um, it really is exciting times. I'll talk, the, the climate smart funding, uh, Ducks Unlimited, has really worked to partner with NRCS, and I got to give a shout out. NRCS is an amazing organization that, I, and I know we had, we had um, had them on stage earlier today, and we're, we're just thrilled to work with them because they have a way of working with landowners on the ground. But they have these funds that actually help landowners manage their water resources on the ground so that they can manage them in a way that's sustainable and pr produces clean water in the outcome. And so there's some really amazing incentives to help landowners do things they want to do on their landscape. So um, how all this weaves together is, is really uh, a part of what we do at Ducks Unlimited every day and, and it keeps us excited about the future today and tomorrow. So Shannon. Yes, sir. Let's go back to um, talk about the Wildlife Court or Florida Wildlife Court and how you, you spent some time working in that place just south of here called the Florida Everglades, or is it America's Everglades? It's America's Everglades. Yeah, so your experience there, and now this this movement, the Florida Wildlife Corridor, 
What are your observations about what we can learn from branding the Everglades, branding the corridor, and, and using that as a tool to garner federal support and federal attention? Yeah. So I think one of the lessons learned from the Everglades is that um, when you are, particularly when you're seeking national funding sources, so federal money, you bring federal money to the table, it being in Florida, if you're a species or a landscape that happens to be in Florida, it's actually a very good thing because um, there are so many important people in our country who have personal connections to Florida. Um, I have in all these years brought so many, been on tours with or guided tours with members of Congress, for example, from all over the country, from California to you know everywhere, all over the place. And I brought them to Florida and not a, there has not been, a, there was never a single time where that person had never been to Florida before. And in fact, usually it was, I caught my first fish in Florida, I have my most magical childhood memories in Florida, my grandson caught his first fish in Florida, um, and there was already an emotional attachment uh, to the natural resources. In my case, you know, we were working on Everglades. I think that ex that familiarity, that personal connection to Florida can work for the Florida Wildlife Corridor, corridor as well. Um, I am so impressed. I spent some time on the foundation's website and, and what I'll say that, that I love about what you all have done with the corridor is that you have married up art with, with this incredible policy and conservation initiative and, and so in doing so, you've created some beautiful communication capability. You've created these beautiful maps that people can really connect to. These communication tools that I know have been in the works for a very long time um, are really impressive. I, I wish I could, I hope you know how impressive they are. And I think you can cash in <laughs> on that um, because Florida is already an easy state to talk about when it comes to the, what people love about this state. So I think that's a big piece of it. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think also, don't forget, you have a lot of national de designations in this, in this state. So you've got the big ones that everybody knows about, right? You've got Everglades National Park, Big Cypress, Biscayne. You've got Gulf Islands and the, and the Panhandle. But you have National Wild and Scenic Rivers. You have two new ones, by the way, um, Little Manatee, right, and Kissimmee. Mm -hmm. You've got Plus Wakaiva, which is the very first river I ever canoed on and the very first river I ever camped on, believe it or not, and Loxahatchee. You have the National Scenic Trail. So you have already, you've got some big designations that can connect into um, you know, the vision that, that you all are, are have already pulled together for the wildlife corridor, and, and I think melding those and, and leveraging those is, is also an opportunity for you. So I tease Shannon, if you follow her on social media, follow Department of Interior, she, she, she's, this is a big country to cover in her job, but I tease her about following her and the, talking about attention to the state of Florida. She's at every ribbon cutting or, or, or you, oh, yeah. you, you wield a lot of golden shovels, I do. groundbreaking. <laughs> I do. Um, you have been able to make it work so you could come to celebrate partnership funding efforts and, and, and doing new things with the funding that the federal government has a hand in. So I think that's pretty cool that you've been able to work that into your looking at the whole country. Yeah, I call it the white tent circuit. And I, I tell, for all my friends in the Everglades, they know it, I, t I tease them and I say, just keep, the more white tents in the Everglades, the happier I am. A white tent usually means a celebration. It's a groundbreaking, it's a ribbon cutting. And it is really important as we work on these very long initiatives that take a lot of years, especially in a state of like Florida where you have constant newcomers coming, it's really important to celebrate your successes and where you can and where it's appropriate and where your partners feel comfortable doing it, celebrating those in a way that you're both your investors, who might be Congress, the legislature, um, you know, your water management district board, whoever it is that you're pulling dollars from, your investors, and the public at large feels like the initiative is moving forward. I think it's really important. And it also, it's good for all of you. You're the practitioners. It's good to take a moment and celebrate the successes. And then you can get back to work, you know, a couple hours later and 
put your nose back to the grindstone. Um, you know, I, I always have a cut the ribbon and then what's next? You know, put the shovel, take the picture, and then all right, let's get back to work. That was always sort of how I felt, like a sense of urgency. But it is really important to, um, that's another communication yeah. strategy as well. Well, I think it has brought attention to Florida and what we're doing here. And you're so right. Most of the people I know that work in this arena are like, don't make me go to a dang press conference or any, don't make me do any PR. Let me go do my job. Let me go protect the land or manage the land. And I think it's cool. So speaking of the land, Zach, I want to come back to, we talked about NRCS, we've talked about working lands, and as you know, Florida, this corridor is just is such a mosaic of working landscapes, cattle ranches, groves, things like that, that are really, people make a living off this land, but we want to conserve it, they want to conserve it. Talk about the Farm Bill and what you see currently and what may be coming down the pipeline for, with the Farm Bill to help provide incentives and support for these kind of properties and this work on the landscape. Sure. Yeah, and before I get into the Farm Bill itself, um, I do just want to set the stage a little bit about, and, and just again underscore, Nick, to your point, the importance of private and working lands to wildlife conservation and the corridor. Um, you know, from my time with Western Governors, Western Landowners Alliance, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of learned to retrain my brain a little bit, and I think there's a tendency when we look at functional habitat, a functional corridor, you zoom in, um, and in the West, it's particularly the case where you have, you know, vast swaths of federal land that may you know, be deemed in various states of protection, um, you, you, look, you zoom in on the private portion of that corridor, and I think the first thought that comes to a lot of our minds is, well, what can go wrong here, and how do we prevent it? Um, I think instead we need to start thinking about what is going right here, if the wildlife are already using this corridor, if it's already successful and a part of it, and how can we continue that? It's a very slight difference in thinking, but I think it's really essential. Um, and that's really where the Farm Bill comes in. It's, it's the single, I just have to remind myself of this, it's the single largest source of funding for private land conservation. Um, and you know, as we look at the importance of private land, that's obviously gonna be a huge part of this. And, and so I think, there was a lot of work done in 2018 in the Farm Bill that did integrate wildlife migration and corridors more specifically into NRCS programs and Farm Service Agency programs. One example would be uh, a, a relatively minor tweak in the grassland conservation program that allowed USDA to prioritize enrollment of contracts for land that supports or enhances wildlife migration or conserves at-risk and T&E species. And so just a little tweak in that bill language there has now led a few years down the line to what I think is a blossoming and emerging partnership in the Wyoming U.S. Department of Agriculture Big Game Pilot Project. Um, and so we, I was involved in that with Western landowners, continue to be involved with TRCP, and it's a very exciting model that I think could be built on in the next Farm Bill. And without getting too into the weeds, the idea really is that USDA came to the state of Wyoming, or vice versa, I'm not quite sure how it all unfolded, but mm -hmm. um, the state of Wyoming had designated corridors, they had landowners that wanted to buy in, what they were lacking, I think, was resources and some partnership to a certain extent. Um, the USDA came in, brought a slightly new model where programs that had been used separately traditionally, so the Conservation Reserve Program was used separately with the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, was used separately from ASAP, which is the easement program, and bundled that all together with the specific purpose of conserving corridors. So it's really, to my knowledge, the first time that there has been a bundling of all these different Farm Bill authorities specifically targeted on one outcome. And you know, the results, it's still unfolding, it's still a pilot project, but I can tell you landowners were very excited about it. The early numbers look great in terms of enrollment. So one thing that we at TRCP are working on with a number of our partners is codifying that pilot program and expanding it nationwide. We want USDA to be able to do this type of partnership work, not just in Wyoming, but in Florida and all over. Um, also looking at some potential changes and some, some concepts that would promote virtual fencing, other things along those lines, and better integrate wildlife migration just more broadly into NRCS programs. Um, so I think that's the potential that I see, and that's why I'm excited by this next Farm Bill. Just really quickly, I guess, to touch on the status of the Farm Bill. Uh, I think it's no secret that Congress is pretty far behind in that regard. By 28, or at this time in 2018, both the House and Senate had passed their versions of the Farm Bill, and we're already in conference reconciling differences there. At this point now where we sit, we haven't seen a bill from the House or Senate. The Farm Bill is set to expire in a few days. Um, realistically, we have until the end of the year before mandatory funding starts to lapse. 
So I think you know a best case scenario is something by the end of December, potentially, as a final bill that's going to be a big lift. Um, maybe more realistically, some sort of short-term extension into the spring. So you're saying there's some reason for hope with Congress going ahead and moving forward? <laughs> <laughs> I'll take anything I can ever, get. Ever the optimist, yes. <laughs> I, lo I love it. Um, but one thing that I've seen over a career of over 35 years working in Florida, I, I, I started my career down in this part of the state, in, in the southwest side, and uh, working with landowners back when I started, uh, you, know, you know, you get in, you develop relationships. It's about building trust and relationships. But back then it was like, son, I don't want to see my property on, on any of your damn government maps. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they had good reason to feel that way. Mm -hmm. uh, the agencies weren't working to build trust or relationships. And I've seen a lot of that change. And I've seen how the trust is growing and the opportunities to work together uh, on that landscape, and the Farm Bill has been a big part of that, building that trust and helping, and NRCS and how they go about working with landowners. So I've seen it across most of the agencies that are now working hand in glove, and it's, 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 it's making a major difference, and I just love seeing that. So um, I'm gonna shift over, uh, Shannon, now we talk a lot about private lands, and one of the things we focus on a lot with the Wildlife Quarter has been uh, land acquisition, land protection, uh, you know, taking care of that, getting that land protected and, and in some kind of ownership that it's going to have some conservation value retained. But public lands, mm -hmm. federal public lands are a big part of that. And we start, talk, started out with the announcement. Yeah. But managing those lands, once you have it secured and protected, you can't just walk away. And that's the cool thing about on working lands because the ranchers and landowners are taking care of that land and their stewards. Talk about how that works on public lands and the importance of managing habitat for wildlife. Without the habitat, it's not gonna be a wildlife corridor. Yeah. Yeah, so land management is a huge um, consideration for, the, for, the, for, for federal public lands. And, um, and again, working those lands, even public lands, um, having those lands managed on the public's behalf is a really, it's always, it's been a, a, a tool, it's a tool all over the country. Um, that's uh, you know tried and tested and understood. Um, I think what has evolved over decades has been the use of that tool to also meet wildlife protection objectives, right? So the sort of private management of public lands has been something that we've been doing for a long time. What's newer, again, none of this is new in Florida. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you another quick little story, but to, to demonstrate that to you, but um, what's newer is this idea of how can we use working lands to meet multiple objectives, including ecological objectives, connectivity objectives, wildlife protection objectives. And the great news is that we can do that. There are many, many places where um, we can do that, and private landowners um, have known this for a very long time. You know, when I was when I worked for the World Wildlife Fund, we began the uh, Florida Ranch Lands Environmental Services Project. Um, I brought Sarah Lynch here, if any of you guys remember Sarah Lynch and Lynn Shadman. Anyway, um, that was one of the very first things that you know Sonny Williamson and those guys told me is I spent a lot of time in that in the Kissimmee Basin in those ranch lands and saw so much wildlife. They knew it, you know, they knew it. And so it's to your point, um, Zach, I think you, the way you said it was so great was that we, um, conservation can mean a lot of things. It can mean, we can conserve lands and still have them be productive lands. And I think that we've, we've proved that concept here. I will tell you this quick story, and which, which I told them already, so I apologize for repeating it. But when I first took this job, I was very, my biggest insecurity was that I had spent my entire career in Florida. I had only ever worked in one ecosystem, and I was very shy about that, like thinking, gosh, I'm gonna seem like a hayseed when I get out there and I go to these places that are, you know, the country's so big. And what I figured out pretty quickly is a couple things. Number one, in so many ways in conservation, Florida is so far ahead of the game. Um, and that was such a wonderful thing for me to realize, you know, where I would be on a conference call and I'd hear folks saying things and I'd think, wow, we did that 15 years ago, you know? So that was really nice. And then the other thing I learned is that if you stay in an ecosystem long enough, you really do, you see it all. And it's all kind of the same for the most part, except for Alaska, I will say that. Everything is different in Alaska. <laughs> I, I will say Alaska is different, I will give you that. But anyway. Very good. Yeah. So talking about public lands a little bit, um, 
I've seen the Fish and Wildlife Service, the Park Service, from early in my career to now um, reaching out and, and doing more partnering, working with the, yeah. the, the sportsmen and women, the hunters and anglers and people that want to get out on the land and access opportunities and partnering on doing cleanups and on refuges and things like that where they come together. I, I think that's really cool to see that and uh, how, how, how we're even across. And at times that's been a little bit tenuous as far yeah. as those relationships. So it's really building that trust from us, the sportsman's community over now with, with the, the federal land holdings. Uh, Zach, talk a little bit about your perspective. Looking from your work out west now into Florida, um, how sportsmen and women, hunters, anglers, have been a part of the conservation initiative and now you see it playing forward here in Florida with the Wildlife Corridor. Yeah, sure. And at the risk of preaching to the choir here, um, you know, I think a lot of this really just comes back to the fundamentals of the North American model of conservation, where it is this user pay model uh, that state wildlife conservation, which if we're going back to what I was talking earlier about uh, in terms of proactive conservation, getting well ahead of the ESA is where the game is going to be at, is by and large funded by hunters and anglers. There's an excise tax on hunting and fishing equipment, there's license sales, that goes in um, and comes back out to the states, and that is really what is supporting this work. So, when we talk about um, you know why sportsmen are caring about this, why they're involved in it, and why it's so important that sportsmen and women are at the table for these conversations, that really is a big part of it. Just the funding contributions and otherwise. You know, I think thinking about the the corridor itself. Um, just a quick note when it comes to access. You know, I think when we think about the future of conservation, this long-term, durable, stable funding, access has to be a part of that component. And I'll just speak from the sportsmen and women perspective. Um, at, if we're thinking about funding long into the future, we need to be growing the next generation of hunters and anglers. And a lot of that comes back to access and opportunity. Um, for looking for quality habitat leading to quality opportunity, again, this comes back to recruiting that next generation, giving them opportunities, getting them into it, and then the feedback loop continues. Very good. So um, let's talk kind of, kind of in a wrap-up mode about the things that we see that Florida's getting right, that you talk about Florida being a leader across the nation. I've seen that too. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but we sit here in Florida and just, we, we rightly are looking for that next challenge and how are we gonna climb that next hill? Not mountains in Florida, just hills. And, uh, and so we're, we're thinking, why can we do more? How can we do more? But what do you see the things, and talk a little bit about Florida's history of land acquisition and land protection. Um, Shannon, you want to take a stab at that? Well, I think you've picked a pretty big hill to climb. I think the, the Florida Wildlife Corridor is a, is a big hill. Um, it, it is so worth it. Greg Connect just was talking to me about mountain climbing and how he swears it's worth it. I've never climbed a mountain in my life. He's Did you have to mention Greg? Sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> but he, uh, he says it's worth it. Uh, this, this is a, a mountain that I think is absolutely worth climbing and you've, you know, you've, you've got a big job to do. Um, and it, it's almost, I mean, I don't wanna be accused of hyperbole or of you know, being too dramatic about it, but this is our moment. Um, Florida is so vulnerable. Um, it's so vulnerable. It's so, I mean, for, for those of us who, all you have to do is fly in to any one of our big major coastal, um, you know, urban areas, fly to Tampa, fly to Fort Lauderdale, fly to Miami, and you, you just look down on a clear night and you see how vulnerable we are. We are just floating right on top of the ocean. And it, it means that we collectively have to pay attention to the resilience of our state and um, the resilience of our natural systems are, is directly connected to the resilience of our built systems and our communities. And so you, you guys are doing nothing less than, in my opinion, really securing the future of our beloved state. And it is a beloved place, um, not just by those of us who are from here, grew up here, raised our children here, but for so many people across the country and across the world. So you've, you've picked a big mountain, but, on, but because we have come so far in places like, say, the Everglades, mm -hmm. we've got the right gear, like we're equipped to climb the mountain, and we've got a big group that are climbing together. You're not doing this alone. And um, you've got all this shared priority. I, I spoke to a landowner today who, you know, has been here for seven generations. 
And he, you know, he loves the land, he loves the land. He, how could you not be here for seven generations and not just love this place? And, and hunters and anglers, they love it too. And conservationists, they love it too. Um, so that's, a, that's enough shared ground and enough shared, um, you know, enough, enough shared vision that you've got what it takes to succeed and you certainly have um, the attention of you know people people like like me and others um, that are that are lucky to temporarily <laughs> be in, in leadership positions and we want to be here to help you succeed so well thank you and I, I just as we close one thing I think that Florida can be so proud of that really does foster support from a nationwide perspective and from Washington DC is Florida invests in conservation no Florida question. so proud of Florida's political leadership uh, of reinvigorating land acquisition in Florida uh, and, and dedicate we saw an announcement just a week or so ago about about several big new acquisitions in Florida Flo and I almost in talking to other states about their land acquisition I'm almost sometimes embarrassed about talking <laughs> about how great Florida is um, but to, to me, I had when to you, stop doing that, by the way. People, I was you, annoying the heck out of people. You, you want to bring person. federal partner, show them the money, and it brings more support. It shows that you're so true. you're dedicated, you're committed, you're bringing your you're bringing your A game, and I really believe Florida can, is bringing their A game in that regard. So at the state level, I'm very proud. At local government level, there are many local uh, funding conservation funding programs that are amazing. So it's 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 so heartwarming to see Florida from the grassroots all the way up through leadership supporting conservation. And with that, I'll, I'll thank you both for the time and thank everyone for your time and attention. And thank hope you. we get started. Thank you. Thank you.